colonising our approach to archaeological community engagement. Um, so why is uh, decolonisation uh, important uh, within this context? Um, but we need to consider the professional barriers to providing uh, to public benefit. Um, it's important in an urban placemaking context when you consider that 50% of the world's population lives in urban areas. Uh, development is con concentrated in urban areas where we also find the most diverse communities. The majority of archaeology is development-led and through the contracting sector is where the majority of community engagement and public presentation originates from. So if we really want to provide uh, public benefit, we need to understand and connect with the people within the place. Um, so the Historic England uh, definition of placemaking, I'm not sure if I've heard this already because I missed the, the first half of the session, um, but placemaking is a process we use to shape our public spaces and buildings. It's rooted in community-based participation um, that brings together diverse people um, to improve communities' cultural, economic, social and environmental situation. Um, it's best achieved through a clear understanding of the historic significance of the existing place. Um, and I've also provided here um, a quote from a Reclaim uh, Brixton uh, participant who was talking in about that um, in the second part. I just thought this is a really nice uh, example of uh, definitions of communities. So communities are multiple partially overlapping demographic groups with wildly different aspirations and behaviour. So this is what we're dealing with here when we're talking about community uh, engagement. Uh, Linda Moncton has a uh, uh, session uh, later in the conference uh, on archaeology um, and well-being. And I wanted to flag up uh, this report, which is the What Works Wellbeing, Heritage and Wellbeing uh, report. Um, out of this review that considered a wide range of uh, heritage settings, including archaeological sites, it's found that archaeology can have a positive effect on well-being and of particular relevance to us when we're thinking about placemaking. Uh, pride of place, belonging, ownership, um, and these things are something that we might consider to be a perfect recipe for sustainable and continuous community engagement, uh, potentially, that is. <clears throat> so our profession is faced with a number of new challenges. Um, for those of us working in the planning and contracting sector, these are particularly relevant. Uh, government's vision is for the principles of the Social Value Act to be applied to the whole of government spending and decision making. Um, this has a direct impact on the contracting sector, on relationships with local authorities, archives and repositories. Um, we need to essentially be doing more with fewer resources. Uh, public benefit requires understanding of social, economic and cultural value. And I really wanted to um, sort of pull out cultural value here as a term, um, including uh, all of the societal benefits that uh, the arts and culture can bring, including impact on the economy, on communities and cities, um, and impact on health and, and well-being. Um, so this all looks lovely, um, but for argument's sake, I wanted to take a look at the political and economic drivers of change within our profession. So participation uh, are, and engagement are key elements in our bid to democratise heritage. <coughs> Um, but Fred Allen, I don't know if you can see the uh, reference there, but hang on one second, I will provide it at the end. Um, he argues that in practice, um, our efforts take place in a political and economic context shaped by neoliberalism. His paper warns us to be wary of initiatives intended to double as relief for pressurised institu um, institutional benefits. The changes uh, that are occurring are merely a new form of control uh, enacted through processes of collaboration where power imbalances are masked by discourse of community participation and stakeholder dialogue. Uh, power imbalance and disempowerment are key issues that we need to be aware of um, and address where we can. Because ultimately, people want to live in places that celebrate the cultural heritage. They want to be part of a process that builds and creates, not one that destroys and raises. Um, looking at development in Brixton um, over the past few years, particularly to do with uh, Brixton Arches and development of Atlantic Road. Um, there have been a number of surveys undertaken uh, of people and stakeholders in the area. 100% um, uh, of participants felt it was important for the council or local authorities or the borough councils to consult local communities with regard to development. But 60% of people felt they had not been given adequate opportunity to participate in the consultation process. Uh, the engagement work we undertake is not taking place in a political social vacuum.
communities are often disempowered before development or archaeological works commence. And there is a growing level of frustration and mistrust associated with development. And by the time we move in to civilise the process, paint a happy picture of participation and shape public spaces, the damage has essentially already been done. So what can we do to remedy the situation? Empowerment, belonging, and uh, pride of place are integral to place making. Positive impacts can only come from listening to the needs of communities affected by development. Um, so two quotes pulled, pulled up from the Reclaim uh, Brixton survey. It's one thing to be heard, it's another to be listened to. And another, um, being an independent business owner in Brixton is like being a small voice in a big cave. You have to put in 10 times the effort just to be heard, and all the time you know there'll be no action. Um, so going back to the heritage uh, wellbeing um, study, um, it found that potential negative impacts of interventions appear to be related to how well the design and delivery of interventions considered the needs of specific individuals and groups. So we need to question whether it's possible to consider the needs to understand, connect with and empower communities when the social and demographic makeup of our profession is so out of sync with society, particularly within urban <coughs> context. Um, we're really good at engaging with some communities, but not all. So we're probably all aware of the lack of diversity of, uh, within the profession. Um, Hannah Cobb, uh, who's chair of the Equality and Diversity Group, kindly uh, let me use her Digging Diversity uh, to um, uh, stats. This hasn't been published uh, as, as yet, but this is from a survey that she undertook in 2017. It's a bottom-up survey, uh, rather than a, a top-down survey um, that profiling professions, for example, um, um, is. Um, so she managed to reach 12% of the UK workforce, uh, and half of the that is. Um, so 3.4% uh, of the workforce can be considered BAME or other, um, 2.6% uh, um, gave no response, and 94% white, whereas 86% of the UK population was white. So there was a, 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 big, a big disparity there. Um, uh, Leah Howardy, um, she's undertaking uh, a study at the moment. Uh, she studies at uh, uh, Royal um, uh, Holloway, um, and uh, she is uh, measuring uh, or looking at measures taken undertaken by contractors. Um, and she found that very few measures are taken to ensure that engagement takes place with groups of people from different uh, ethnic backgrounds or people with disabilities. Time scale and resources, unsurprisingly, are cited um, as reasons for this. So as a profession, we're not really uh, well equipped. Collaboration may be one way to change this, but in order to progress, we must also look to the past and the colonial roots of archaeology impacting on our ability to engage. Uh, this is quite a heavy slide, and I'm not sure if I've got time to it's go through. Right. Five minutes left. Yeah. Crap, no, I don't have time to go through this whole thing. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so the majority of professional archaeologists have entered the profession from uh, the university, uh, where we find, um, uh, again, a very undiverse um, environment, which can be socially or racially biased. Um, archaeology is interdisciplinary. Um, but ways of teaching, reading lists, objectives and outcomes are very undiverse. Uh, field schools tend to be monocultural, can be hyper-masculine environments, uh, with reports of uh, sexual harassment and racial harassment. And this culture um, has been inherited and amplified uh, within, within the profession. Um, and we may also be inheriting um, colonial transference and counter-transference issues. So these are um, terms used traditionally within psychology, but it's something that hasn't yet been studied and something that perhaps uh, we should be looking uh, towards uh, um, uh, studying a little bit more. Um, so this colonial inheritance transference has a, a, a big negative impact on interpretation, public presentation, and public perception of archaeology and our ability to engage with uh, diverse audiences. Um, okay, so for now, um, let's look at what we might do within our day-to-day -day roles to decolonise our own practice. Um, so I work within Greater London Archaeological Advisory Service. Um, GLASS maintains the GLHER, um, and uh, this uh, contains, say, 90,000 entries 
uh, information relating to archaeological sites, historic buildings, parks and landscapes, finds and heritage features, and all of the um, data, and this is the data upon, uh, upon which all glass advice um, is based. Um, closer working with HERs could be seen as a fundamental element um, of placemaking. If placemaking is best achieved through a clear understanding of the historic significance of the, of the existing place, then HDRs are definitely a, a good place to start. So something that I've done is sort of look uh, internally and externally and ask a, a, a set of questions, um, uh, just to question my own understanding of archaeology and, uh, and also just to um, try and start that process of decolonisation. So some of these questions um, you might use um, could be who defines heritage, who defines significance, who decides what we record and what we don't? Who contributes information to enhance understanding of the historic environment and who doesn't? Um, when do we record data? Who can access the data? Um, who knows about the data? Who can edit and, and enhance the data? Um, and also some questions that are more kind of self-reflection uh, uh, based. For example, how did I get here? Uh, what privileges enabled me to be here? Um, What's my own definition of heritage and how diverse is my organisation? Uh, once you've tried to answer some of these preliminary questions, we can start to make changes. Um, for me, this has meant working on community-led uh, or community-focused projects using HDR data to start conversations. Um, as an example, a workshop I delivered uh, last year at the Caribbean Social Forum in, in Woolwich, um, we were looking at archaeological priority areas. Um, a lot of participants were keen to know about possibly slavery links at the Woolwich Arsenal. Archaeology can con um, contribute people's, contribute to people's understanding and enjoyment of place. Um, people like to know what's on their doorstep, and if we listen carefully, we can gain better understanding of what communities need. For example, heritage seen as contentious for some may actually be very empowering for others. Um, so new approaches to recording, interpretation, and accessibility is something that we're working on uh, within GLASS and the GLHER. Um, through implementation of our Arches project, which is the move away from uh, a database system um, that, uh, uh, to a cloud-based system. Um, and uh, this will enable uh, the, us to incorporate alternative forms of data um, and heritage data. Um, it removes the costly need for licenses to access, access and edit the database that kind of currently exists. Um, we can incorporate local uh, GIS data held on the London Development Database so that archaeological information can be displayed alongside demographic, social, and uh, economic data. So as I, I mentioned before, change starts at home, and we can all start to apply questions like this to our own job roles and, and organisations. So to summarise, placemaking is rooted in community-based participation. As a profession, we need to uh, uh, re-equip ourselves with the tools to understand and engage with multiple partially overlapping demographic groups with wildly different aspirations and behaviour. Um, if placemaking is best achieved through a clear understanding of historic significance, we must challenge ourselves to work outside of our comfort zone, uh, listen to the needs of people most affected by development, seeking wider interpretation, finding creative ways to share knowledge, not to hoard knowledge. Um, we need to work creatively um, within and be aware of how wider social, political and economic agendas can exacerbate the invasion and, and colonisation trope which, which persists in the public perception of archaeology. Um, we need to look at decolonisation of academia and profession, um, we need to challenge behaviour and practice that encourages or aids the establishment and maintenance of the domination of a place, people or culture, or behaviour and practice that masks power imbalances or disempowers communities. Um, diversity in academia is, is really important. Um, what and how we study um, sort of translates into diversity uh, within the profession. Um, this then translates into improved public perception of archaeology and which then feeds back into the process of diversity in our academia. It's a cyclical process, so addressing at least one of those uh, points will help improve the process as a whole. Um, so facilitating change, what can we do? What can we take home today? Uh, critical assessment and self-reflection is key. Change starts at home. Um, look at your organisation and, uh, and their stakeholders. Um, collaboration and communication, engagement teams, work closely with, it, with engagement teams. Um, and, and also just acknowledge that um, equality and diversity training isn't often enough. Um, today you may start work in a new organisation and equality and diversity training uh, is limited to a, a simple module 
that you undertake once and you don't get to uh, return to ever again. So what we really need to be doing is looking at our uh, CPD and what's available within the sector and outside of the sector. Um, things like unconscious bias training and decolonization toolkits, um, whether that's academic or, or professional. Yes, and amazing. <laughs>